Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're just waiting for people to come on board, and um, uh, we'll be going. So we'll be starting in about one or two minutes. So uh, please be patient, and uh, we'll be kicking off soon. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Solid Edge Advanced Modeling webinar. Uh, the webinar will go for approximately one hour, and uh, at the end of it, uh, we will be taking uh, Q and A um, via the um, uh, via the uh, box at the mo at the bottom of the page um, on the side. You can see this little messenger box. If you can just send any questions at any time through to that, but we will answer them at the end of the uh, webinar. Um, but uh, please feel feel free to pass them through at any time. So uh, today's webinar will be conducted by myself, Barry Bevis, and Tom Harris, uh, who will actually be doing a live demo demonstration of various advanced features uh, with Solid Edge. Um, this screen gives you some idea of uh, some of the technology with inside of Solid Edge and what we're going to go through this afternoon. So Solid Edge obviously has um, a very unique environment called synchronous technology. Uh, we will see some of that this afternoon. We have the traditional ordered modeling, which you may have seen in another CAD system, so that's the traditional way of modeling with history trees, etc. Uh, integrated simulation will not show, and that's just a, um, uh, an add-on, if you like, that goes for Solid Edge that allows many different things. Uh, manufacturing being NX Cam Express. Um, as an option to add on, and of course, various options with document management. So um, I'll hand over to Tom now, who will take this demonstration on and give you some idea of what we're going to show you, and then actually go live. And we'll Thanks, Tom. All right. Thanks for that. Um, basically, this is this is the agenda for today. We'll we'll have a look at some of the surface modeling tools, how we go about surfacing, which is we generate the curves, from the curves we generate surfaces, and from the surfaces we stitch them together into solids. We'll also look at some of the multi-body modeling tools and how you can use those tools to generate a full-blown assembly. Uh, then we'll move on to sheet metal for non-straight break bodies. Uh, these are things like chined boat hulls, maybe an auger, um, and maybe a square to round transition, that kind of stuff. After that, I'll show you two of the uh, commands that we use to get the approximate size of the sheet metal we need. Um, the flatten command, which is very, very accurate, and the blank command, which actually uses some sheet metal properties, um, strength, coefficients, and that kind of thing, in order to work out how the material will flow in order to flatten things like deep drawn components and non-ruled um, non surfaces. Next, we'll have a look at rendering, and we'll, we'll be using the integrated Keyshot rendering there, um, which is included with the premium and classic packages. And next, after that, we'll finish up with reverse engineering. Now, this is a new, uh, a new module in Solid Edge, which was re released uh, one or two weeks ago uh, to beta. Um, it is a public beta, so you guys can download it from GTAC if you want to try it out. And it's a tool to convert STL files, which is a mesh style uh, data file, typically from scans and things like that, into real editable parametric surfaces. So that's what we'll be looking at today. I'll just switch over to Solid Edge, and you can see I, I didn't really want to bore you with uh, normal 
normal sketching. I've just got two simple sketches in this part. And what I'll be doing is I'll be creating a, uh, basically a boat out of some of these sketches. Now, the first thing we want to do is we just want to edit a little bit more into these sketches. And I want to put in a, a break line into this sketch and it's just going to be a simple straight line. I'll give it some dimensions, maybe 100 mil from the back and we'll make that a five degree angle. I add that into the side profile. Now you might be wondering what this sketch here is. Well that is a plan profile of effectively the form I want this hull to take. But I'm not quite finished there with the hull. So I need a little bit more information. As you can see, I've got an angle on the back of the boat. I need to, first of all, determine where the back of the boat finishes. I'm going to count the staff in because I'm actually looking at the attentiveness and stuff. Uh, I'm on YouTube. Okay. So the back of the boat will come across and I'll set a width at the back of the boat. I also want a basically a, a transition at the, uh, at the bottom of the back. So I'll do a line there. And lastly, we want to go from the very tip of the base onto the end. And you'll see, you'll, you'll, you'll see as I start generating these curves, why we need them that way. So I'll just give these some dimensions. I might make that 750. And I'll say that at the bottom, I want it to be only 720, for example. Then I'm going to draw, I'll just switch back to the plan view. I'm going to draw the profile that I want this curve to have as it meets up with this, this sort of deflection line. And I can modify that. If I want a little bit more control, more than I've currently got, I can of course change a B spline degree. And as you can see that adds more points onto my B spline more envelope points and it gives me just a little bit more accuracy with defining that shape. Lastly, because this curve here is supposed to represent the very top of the hull, I should connect the end of that, whoops, not in connect, I'm in line, connect the end of that onto the line which joins up to the top. So that's all we need to do in terms of sketching for now. Next, I come into the surfacing commands and we have a really powerful tool. We have quite a lot of powerful sketching tools, but one of them is a cross curve. And this allows me to take a curve like the top of the boat sketched from one, from, you know, a side view and combine that with a curve sketched on the elevation into a nice, clean, three-dimensional sketch, just like that. So it's a really useful tool for complex design. I'll also do the same thing for what I want to be basically a deflector line along the side of the hull. Lastly, I want to create an edge along here. I'll come back to that and do that a little bit later though. Next, we've now got those two curves. What are we actually going to do with them? Well, I want the line along here to be a very, very clean, um, simple line. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to do a swept surface. Now, if I want to sweep multiple curves along this edge, then I use multiple paths and cross sections. Um, single path and cross section is one path, one cross section. 
If there's any doubt which you need, always choose multiple because you have the option of only actually using one. Oops, I don't want that to be a chain. Just want that to go to that single line. I want it to move along that path. Oops, I think I messed that up. Let me go back and do that again. Go from there to there. Next, along this path. And you see how it generates a very clean line. This is actually a ruled surface because you can see you can put a ruler between the top and bottom all the way around the surface. Okay, so that's our first, our first profile, if you like. However, you can see also that it's extended past. That's because the line I used was the front line. And so now I need to basically trim that surface off at the dividing line. Not a problem. I can simply select the curve to trim the surface. All right, so that's, that's that part. Next, what I want to do is I want to create a, a deflection board so that as the water comes up to this deflection board, it'll actually be kicked off at an angle. Now, I don't know if any of you have used the ruled surface command. It's quite a powerful one. And it lets you, I, I can create a ruled surface that is tangential to the surface I pick. I can make it normal. I can make it tapered to a plane, natural, or the one I want to use is angled according to an axis. Now, I'm going to use the back edge as my axis, and I'm going to use this edge here as the line I'm going to taper along. And you can see that in this case, it's making an 80 mil line that or an 80 mil surface that runs at an angle of 110 degrees to the line I picked. Now, I might not want 110. I might, for example, only want 70. I might make that a little bit more, 80. Now you can see that it's quite a clean line and it runs at an angle of 80 degrees to this all the way along. You've got, you know, other options there. You might want to sketch another line and control that separately. But for what I want to do, that 80 mil is quite acceptable. So next, what I want to do is I want to, um, I want to do a back plane for this boat on the backboard. How will I do that? Well, I'll use by th a plane by three points. And I want the first point to be the bottom origin here. I want the second point to be the end of that line. And the third point to be this line up here. You see, I've now got that plane. And I can jump onto that plane and happily sketch the bottom edge. Now, notice that the plane projects through the, or sorry, the surface projects through the plane I'm sketching on. I want to sketch from this thing called a pierce point, which is where that curve pierces the line. It's quite a useful, very powerful tool. So that creates that bottom edge that I need. Um, that's pretty much all I need on that plane. So I can close that. I probably could have used a, a 3D sketch command as well, but I didn't. Um, let me just hide that other sketch so it doesn't look too confusing. 
Next, I have to create, um, because, I'm, because the surface that I'm going to fill the bottom with has to end up on here, it also has to come in here. So I can't actually use that first profile. So what I'll do is I'll do another sketch on the mid plane. And this one is going to come from, again, this point here, down. I'll keep that at an angle and connect it onto the bottom line. Then I'll just finish that off back to the end. I need to make it tangent because I didn't do that. And I can specify the curvature on the bottom there. Lastly, I haven't specified this angle, but I actually want it to maintain the same angle. So I'll simply put a parallel in there. So now I've got all of my profiles that I need. I can simply come back to surfacing. Now I could use a number of tools for this. I could use a bounded curve because, oh, sorry, a bounded surface because it's all connected. I could use a blue surf. Um, that's actually probably what I'm going to use. I could also sweep, but I want to use a blue surf. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from this profile around to this profile here. See, so it generates a very quick preview, but that's not quite what I'm after yet. With Blue Surf, you have the option of adding guide curves. Oop, what have I done? Okay, I haven't trimmed off the end there, and because it goes past the end of my curve, I need to trim that off. So I'll say I want to trim this surface with that plane and with that plane. And I just need to trim off those extra little bits there. Now I should be able to quite happily Do my blue surf from that profile to that one along that edge. And you see it forms quite a nice clean boat hull. If I need, I can also add additional control by inserting further sketches. I won't do that at this point, but I'll just I'll just quickly show you. See how you can add an additional sketch into your blue surf. I'm not going to, so I'll just hit escape. And there's my nice clean half of a boat hull. So, so far we're doing pretty well. Lastly, I just need to fill in the back section of the boat. Oops, what have I done there? Looks like I didn't uh, do that through far enough. So I'll just extend that out to there and I'll have to trim that off with this plane as well. And then I can do the blue surf. Now, sorry, not the blue surf, the bounded surface on the end of the boat. Now bounded surface, Basically, you go through and you pick the edges that you want to be the edge of your surface. As soon as you have edges that are not basically all in line, if you have this option checked, it will close that boundary and fill in the remaining edge for you. Um, it's quite a useful tool because it just means you don't have to have this top curve or sketch. Now I have so it doesn't make any difference for me but sometimes that 
can be very beneficial. So I finish that, turn off my curves and sketches, and you can see I happily have half a boat hull. Um, that's not all I want to do. I want to uh, I want to increase the width of this. I can do that now, or I can do that later in my modelling. Um, I might I might do it now. So I'll mirror that about this plane. Notice I've now got two separate surfaces. I don't want them separate. I want them joined. So I'll simply use the stitch command to join those two up together. Now, if I if I was doing solid modelling from this boat and I wanted to turn this into a solid, firstly, I probably wouldn't have the mirror there. I'll just back up a little bit. And I'll turn on that sketch. I would probably do something like that's one edge that's another face and you'll see I've got surfaces individual surfaces that bound this body if I want to turn that into a solid all I do is stitch those surfaces together and you see it creates a solid automatically. Now, I don't actually want to do that, so I'll just undo that command and go back to where I was. Get rid of those two. But that, that's how you create a solid from a, a series of surface bodies. So we've got all of the various surfaces modelled into our component. Um, I'm just going to switch back to the PowerPoint and just show you we've, we've generated curves. We can use sketches, cross curves. There are also intersection curves and a thing called an isocline curve. Um, the isocline curve is a particularly nice one if you've got if you need to create a curve on a surface that always makes a constant angle with something. So I'll just, I'll delete this later, but I'll just show you an isocline surface from the base on this surface, and I'll make it um, 30, maybe 30. Doesn't want really to do it for this surface. I might have messed up the bottom a little bit. Typically what you'll find is whatever makes a 40 degree angle with the surface, you'll see a line running all the way around. Um, doesn't seem to be working at the moment. If you've got any questions on that one after the webinar, please let me know because it is quite a powerful command. I won't waste your time trying to work out what's happening there though. Um, so that's the isocline curve. Then we've generated swept surfaces from those curves, ruled surfaces, blue surf, and boundary surfaces. We have another command, which you'll see a little bit later when we get to the reverse engineering as well, that's intersect, and that's a very, very useful command. How to generate solids from surfaces? Well, you stitch them together. And if you want to do sort of hybrid solid surface modeling, you can also replace surface um, solid surfaces with a surfacing surface. So that's, that's quite a powerful command there as well. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so next, what we're going to be looking at is a little bit of multi-body modeling. Now, multi-body modelling is particularly suited to something like this, where you've got all of the geometry in one body. So I come in here, and 
I've got various commands. I can add bodies. At the moment, I haven't got any solid bodies here. So I'm just going to come in and say I want to thicken this part. And I can choose which direction I thicken. Outside, both sides, or inside. I'll choose 5 mil inside. And it creates a solid body that's thickened. You can see there I've now got a design body. I could go and thicken these other parts and all of it would become one solid. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to add another body. I'll call the first body the sideboard. The second body I want to be the, um, the deflector. Okay, so I'm now working on a deflector. I just want to thicken this body. Again, I'll do five millimeters up. Notice, as I start editing, the first body becomes translucent. I can see through it. That's to show me that's not the body I'm currently working on. And lastly, I want to do the hull. So I add another body called the hull, and again, I thicken the hull. And it's taking a bit longer than it normally does. I'm wondering if, if, if I've uh, accidentally put some funky um, curvature in that bottom sheet. It is possible. So the whole idea of multi-body modeling is that we generate all of the all of the bodies in one file and then what we do is we export those bodies out to um, their own separate files which are linked back to the master file. And you can see here I've called this part the hull master. And the reason for that is because it is, it is the master file that will drive all of the other sheet metal components in here. Um, this is taking a bit longer than I was expecting. What I might just do, because I don't want to keep you waiting, so I might just kill that and open up the one that I actually finished before. Um, Just fire that up. So I'm just opening up this one. And you can see that I've actually thickened the back plate as well. So I was I was two steps away from here. I've got a series of design bodies, a backboard, a sideboard, a deflector, and the hull. Now, what I want to do here is, I, after I've created these multiple bodies, I actually want to turn each of those bodies into their own file and work on them. So the way we do that is we come into multi-body publish. It's quite a, whoop, something's going on with my machine. It's not liking me. Let me try that again. No, 
it's having a hernia. I apologise for this. Um, while Tom's uh, just doing that, maybe uh, we could, uh, you could send some messages through uh, and um, we could uh, maybe answer your questions just while he's rebooting. And it'll only take a few, uh, few seconds. I'll just jump to the next stage. Um, after typically what happens is you open up the multi-body publish tool it publishes a file and you get a hull master assembly. Now, I was going to be doing the deck modeling later, but you get a hull master assembly and each of these files in the assembly, you can see is linked back to the hull master. Um, what we do then, I'll delete all of this so you actually get to see it. What we do then is this is basically a chined boat hull or a ruled surface. Uh, it's, in, it's in the part environment, um, which I'll just switch back to the part environment. This is the environment it comes in as if you selected to create a part from it. Um, you can come to tools and you can switch to the sheet metal environment, even if the part was modelled as a part. So I switch to the sheet metal environment and then I have this option here called thin part to sheet metal. And what it will do is it will have a look at the component and transform this component into a valid sheet metal body. Um, you might say, well, it's not a valid sheet metal body because it's, you know, twisted and curve. Well, it is actually a valid sheet metal body. It's just not what's called a straight break body. This needs to typically be rolled or something like that. But you can generate a flat pattern from this part with no stretching or deformation of the sheet metal. Now, in solid edge, ordered modelling is slightly more powerful than synchronous modelling, especially in the area of non-straight break bodies. So I want to flatten this body and this will be my bottom surface. And you can see there, it's generated the flat component quite simply and quite easily. All right, so that's the sideboard. We can do the same for the deflector because it is also a ruled surface. We actually created that one as a ruled surface. The first one was a sweep. And of course, the backboard is straight planar. We've got no question about whether that's sheet metal. It's not a problem. However, the hull, this is certainly not typical sheet metal. And let me just delete these steps so I can go back and show you. What we've got here is a body that is curved in two directions at the same time. Okay, what, what you can do in solid edge with this kind of surface, because this is the same as it, it's, it undergoes stretching or compression as you form the shape. So it is a forming operation. It does need special tooling and what the way you work out the blank size of this is you come in to the flatten environment. You don't have to convert this to sheet metal. Any part that is sort of roughly thin walled um, will, or not any part, but most parts that are thin walled can be what's called blanked. And you go into the flatten environment, you can see I've got two commands, flatten and blank. Now in the blank command, these are the keys that you've got to get according to your material properties. It's the strain hardening exponent and the strength coefficient. 
So once you enter them, you can select the surface and you can position this cursor depending on which direction you actually want to pull the model. Now we've got a five mil thick and I want to offset the surface to be flattened by two and a half so it is basically represents the mid surface of this part. I hit preview and it goes, you can see there on the, on the screen, the blanked surface. However, notice surface area of selected faces was 231 or 2,310,000 millimetres squared. The computed blank has a slightly different area. The reason for that is because we've told it to do a very coarse accuracy. The finer you go, the longer it takes to compute, but the closer the surface area will be. See, now we're 23 and 22.8. That's pretty close. You can, of course, go finer and finer to get the blank more accurate. When you're happy with that, you hit finish, and you've now got a blank of the formed component. And this is the approximate blank that you should get. Obviously, you know, tooling and how many press operations you've got will affect the, the blank shape. But this is a way of flattening those very, very complex surfaces. So after that, we can simply do a mirror and I'll just show you the mirror command. You select the bodies you want to mirror. Obviously, I don't have to select the back. Select the parts I want to mirror. I say mirror. It, and then I need to confirm that and select the mirror plane. It gives me a dialog which says, OK, yes, I'm going to mirror these components. SolidEdge is quite unique in that if a component is symmetrical, instead of it saying mirror, it will actually allow me to rotate the previous component and use it again. And it gives me the, or it suggests the file names. I can change these if I want. I won't at this point. And hit finish. It goes away and generates those files and places them in position in the assembly. Now, if I go back and edit the master part, it will update this part, which will in turn update this part. Everything will update. So that's a quick look at the multi-body modeling components in Solid Edge. So I'll just switch back to the PowerPoint. You've seen, we've done them, well, you didn't see um, because it, Solid Edge was misbehaving, but we've got the multi-body published there and you've seen sheet metal for non-straight break bodies, how we can transition those bodies to sheet metal. Then we use the thin part um, to sheet metal command. And one thing I'll, I'll see if I can show you shortly um, is you can do lofts and include triangulation marks, for things typically like a square to round. I'm not sure we'll have time for that, actually, just because the... Uh, the other issues cause me to take a little bit more time. But ask me about that um, offline if you have any questions there. Then you can either flatten or use the blank body command. So there's, there's some really nice advanced sheet metal and modeling components. Next, what we want to have a look at is rendering. And this is using the integrated key shot. So I can come in to my assembly and I can simply hit Keyshot Render. It fires up Keyshot and it starts to render. Now, you'll probably notice that your screen is a little bit speckly on the boat. The number of samples determines how speckly it is. The longer it renders for, the less speckly your model is. Um, we can move the body around, move the boat around. But realistically, at the moment, it's a boat sitting on the ground. 
which isn't particularly what you might want from a render. You might want to put this boat in the water. Now, Keyshot has a nice way of adding what's called a ground plane into your model. And then you can position this ground plane. And as you can see, I can lift up the ground plane and you get what's under the boat all become shaded. What I can also do, and I'll just make this a bit bigger so you can actually see it a bit clearer, Keyshot has a whole heap of components or materials, colours, environments, backplates and textures built into it. If you want something further than that, it doesn't have water built into it. So I simply logged on to the Keyshot website and you can use the Keyshot library command down the bottom corner here and you can download additional materials. I grabbed water and I simply place, drop that onto the ground plane and now you can see it's rendering water. But to be honest, that water is looking pretty still. I might want it to be a little bit more exciting. So I just come and say I want to change my ground material, double click on the water. I want to go into the textures and actually edit the texture a little bit. Maybe I want to decrease the scale a little bit. And you can see the waves sort of look as if they're getting closer together. Maybe I want the water to be a bit rougher. Well, you can increase the texture, the bump height texture. You've got all of these commands to edit your materials. Um, speaking of materials, this hull is pretty boring at the moment. So I want to come into the boat and I want to grab all of these components and I want to link their materials because I, I don't want to have to apply a material to each and every one. Well, that's pretty easy. I just say link material. Now, notice in my materials, I've only got two. And I might want to apply, I don't know, um, we could apply a metallic paint. We could apply just a gloss paint, maybe. We'll put it in on red because, of course, everyone knows red goes faster. And you can see the reflectiveness of the gloss paint reflecting the water, all of that kind of stuff. Now, you'll also notice if I just rotate this view, you get quite reasonable underwater views of the component as well. We don't need to go underwater. As you increase the complexity with, you know, um, in, in, um, high bump maps and high reflections, it takes a little longer for the rendering samples to go up but you still end up with quite a reasonable result. Um, I'll just switch back to Solid Edge now, because obviously, you know, this doesn't have any form of deck or railing around the edge, and we want to create something like that. So I simply come in and say, create a part in place. Yep, put it in there, and I'll select mahogany or something like that from the library and I'll call this um, the railing. Okay, so it's created my part. I've got everything else hidden so I turn that back on just with a hotkey and what I want to do is I want to create this on a plane on top. So I say I'm going to create a plane by three points. If I hold down shift I can very easily select key points from the model and then I simply want to project onto this plane some of the edges of this component. Okay, then I'll just trim these edges into corners. Looks like they're already, oh, I've got one inside, one outside edge. So let me just delete that 
and get the outside edge instead. I better zoom in a little bit more to do that. Okay. And you can see it's connected up the top. I also want to have an offset. Maybe I want this railing to be 80 mil long. And I'll just grab the whole chain, offset that 80 mil in, grab the region, and we'll say it's 20 mil thick. Go back to my assembly, and it's looking a little bit better. However, I'd already done some customization in Keyshot, i.e. adding the ground plane, adding the water, all of that kind of stuff. What happens and how do I push this through? Well, I simply go Keyshot Update, and that switches back to Keyshot and updates my component with, or updates my model, with the new deck or the railing. But again, it's a pretty boring railing. I need to add something a little bit nicer to it. So I go into my wood. I've got all sorts of different woods, as you can see. I've got old wood planks. Now maybe I want it to look like an old wood plank. Make sure you drop it onto the right component. And you can see it's adding old wood planks, but they're running across the boat. I don't want that. I want these planks to run down the boat. So I right click and I say edit material for the railing. Come into my textures and all I've got to do is change the angle by 90 degrees. And I get my railing, the angle it should be, and I can go on and finish my render. Now, just a quick note on the render. Where you say render, it will go and save this particular file at whatever resolution you use. You can use the presets or you can type it in. Keep in mind, you do have advanced controls, but if you want your render to look exactly the same as it does on the screen, take a note of the samples at which you're happy with the render. And then you just come and say maximum samples. Maybe I only want this to have 20, which is about what this has got on the screen at the moment. And that looks pretty good. So I say 20 samples and I'll put this in the same directory that I'm working in, which, where is it? As soon as I can find it, I will anyway. Advanced modeling and I'll just call this a rendered boat. Oops, helps if I can spell. I'll do this a 1280 or something like that. I say render, it brings up this window and it starts rendering. Now, you'll see down the bottom the progress bar. This is how far it is through up to my 20 samples. If I want to stop this, if I get to this point and I go, oh, I don't need 20, I can just hit the X and say, save and stop. And this saves out that file at that point in time. Okay, so I'll just close Keyshot. Yeah, I might as well save it. And I'll show you an example of that boat. That was one I did before and the render that I just did, rendered boat. So it's a very, very powerful rendering package that comes with Solid Edge. So you can see we, you know, the ground planes is quite useful. You can link materials. You can even override materials, like I changed the water and you can download your library entities. Now, something else that is very useful, which I won't have time to show you today, is also matching perspective. And this is if you're putting your models into 
a particular scene. Now I'll just switch over to um, importing standard sheet metal uh, bodies and this is traditional style sheet metal. Close that. Yep. Let's just say you've been given a, a body from a supplier and all they can supply it to you in is your good old step format. Okay. I've got a sheet metal part here supplied in step format. I want to bring it into my sheet metal environment and then I want to do a little bit of work on it. Now you can see it's got all sorts of stuff on it. It's got a return flange, it's got a few louvers and it's got some a pattern of holes by the look of it. What can we do with this? Well Solid Edge has a very nice command where it can recognize holes. Now they're the holes it's recognized but it doesn't and they're 6.35. I might want that to be an 8 millimeter hole. I can simply change it just by selecting the hole saying 8. Now they're 8 millimeter holes. But as you can tell and you can see it's now converted them into holes but as you can tell they're a pattern how can we work with that? Well, we can recognize hole patterns. It asks me to select the holes and I say OK. Now, I can, you'll notice it's got a pattern of patterns. I can recognize an entire pattern of hole patterns if I want, or I can just keep it as individual patterns. Okay, I'll keep it as individual patterns for now. You can see it's generated my first set of holes and then it's patterns of those. The first set is one of each of those patterns. However, I don't want these mid holes. I could change each of these patterns separately or in synchronous. I can just select the holes and delete them. Okay, well, that's useful. But what if I want a different spacing on these holes? Okay, if I have a look at the pattern, it's a 3x2 which I've deleted some of, it's 50 by 100. I can change each of these patterns individually, or, whoops, I've got a little bit more than I bargained for there. I can select the holes and I can simply move them. Now notice solid edge synchronous is maintaining this change on the other side of the model as well. I just want to move that whole set by 10 mil. Type it in and I'm done. I may also want to remove the louvers on one side of the part. Simply select, hit delete and they're gone. And you might say well yeah that's all good but this is, you know, we've got to be able to flatten this part and it's an imported part. How do we do that? Well, I can come in to the tools. I'm already, I think I'm in the, yep, I'm already in the part environment. I want to switch to, I, I want to convert this into a sheet metal part. Synchronous has a thin part to sheet metal, however, this gets back to what I was saying before. The ordered style is slightly more powerful because the synchronous will not convert the deformation features into an, a, a flattenable body. So we simply transition to ordered and then I'm going to use the thin part to sheet metal. It shows you the features which will be deformation features and allows you to finish that and then flatten it as a normal sheet metal body. Obviously they're deformation features, they're still deformed in the flat pattern. So that's just a quick look at some of the tools 
in Solid Edge. If I want to go, go back and change any of this, I can simply switch back to Synchronous and maybe I want to, um, I'll just zoom in a little bit there, maybe I want to grab these and move them so that the distance between is 150. Now I don't actually know what the distance is at the moment, but using my steering wheel, whoops, I'm supposed to hold down shift, I can offset my steering wheel to 150 mil, and then I'm just going to move that. Notice the symmetry is, takes care of the other side. So I know that is 150 and that is 150. The overall spacing is my desired 300 millimeters. And I've got a completely flattenable part. However, I might need to do some slightly more complex features. Um, in Solid Edge, you have quite a number of tools. Um, I have my various contour flanges. I also have things called beads, but I can use beads for strengthening, for example, bends or reinforcing, make them a little bit stronger. So I'm going to, I've just unbent that, fl that flange. I'm going to put a bead across this bend. And what that does, notice if I try and go down, it says it will intersect because the, the thickness of the bead is smaller than the bend radius. I'll put this on the outside because it's, it can actually form that. Otherwise, it would create a really high level of deformation and that's not supported. So I'll put my bend or my bead on the outside, and then I can simply re-bend, and you'll see that I've now got a deformation feature across the bend, quite a powerful strengthening tool. But maybe you say, well, I don't actually want that. I want a gusset instead or something like that. Well, you can grab gussets. Notice I can specify all of the properties and when I've got one I want, I can save that. And then it becomes available just to select. I'm going to place a gusset on this bend. I want to put it on the midpoint. Got to find the midpoint. Change my view. It'll give me a bit more of an idea. There it is. So there is my gusset. Another deformation feature on my bend. However, these gussets are not added to the component in the flat pattern. So what happens to the flat pattern? Well, we'll have a look. The gusset is missing because the gusset is added by forming tools after the component is bent. The bead, on the other hand, is added in the flat pattern, as is the louvers. So that's just a quick look at some of the sheet metal tools that are in there. Now, we've got three types of sheet metal tools. We've got, well, four types, but three types of sheet metal. Um, we've got the transition to sheet metal, which allows you to bring an imported body or something that wasn't modeled as sheet metal. We've got straight break sheet metal tools. You've got these in both the sheet metal environment in ordered and in synchronous. Then you've got kind of transition features. And these are things like deep drawing, ruled surfaces, or hems on curves and lofts. These are features which aren't straight break sheet metal, but you can still apply them in the sheet metal environment. These are typically done in the sheet metal environment of ordered modeling. Lastly, you've got formed components. Typically, you model these in the ordered environment with the exception of deep drawing. And you model them in the part environment and you use something like a blank tool to end up with your final component. Next, what we want to have a look at, I'm going to skip the squirt around just because of the time 
we, we might be a little bit over. Um, I'll show you the new reverse engineering tools in Solid Edge. Now, all we need to do to start up these new tools is we need to create a new part. Okay, go in, create a new part. You'll notice if you install it that you get a reverse engineering beta um, tab. So I want to import an STL file. Okay, at the moment it's only STL. Later it will be in, it will be improved to have other formats as well. And you'll see the familiar faceted model imported in here. However, I don't know if you can pick it there. This model is not perfect. It has holes in the mesh. So how do we deal with that? The reason this one has holes is because I wanted to show you, it, it's a real world scenario, and I wanted to show you the tools that Solid Edge has. The first tool is actually called Delete Mesh. Now, this is if you've got a scan that includes a lot of other data that's not relevant to you. We can delete that mesh and continue on. The next step is to fill holes. As Soon as you click fill holes, it analyzes the mesh for any holes in the mesh. Now, as you can see, there's quite a few holes in the mesh, which it's shown me. I can have a look at the individual holes. I can zoom to the particular holes. Zoom to, that's that one on the bottom. You see it highlights. If I don't want a hole filled, for example, I might have a scan of a component where I don't see the bottom, then I can simply delete the hole from the fill holes command. I also have two options. I can fill maintaining curvature or I can fill flat. I want to fill maintaining curvature. I simply hit OK and it's done. Notice the holes are not there anymore. The next step is quite a useful one. And this will sense what type of surface fits these components. Now, if I just hit F1, it brings up the help. And you can see that yellow represents a planar surface. Cyan represents cylindrical. Red represents spherical. And magenta represents a B-spline surface. I also have the option of making some, some areas of the model non-extractable. I won't create a surface from it. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. If I increase the accuracy, then I end up with things, depending on my mesh quality, where it says, okay, this one represents a planar surface. Now, in reality, it doesn't, but if I increase my accuracy so much, it will have a look at those two mesh facets and say I can fit a planar surface onto that. So I just want to bring that back down and leave it as those colours for now. That's the automatic detection. However, I happen to know, and this is one limitation of the beta um, release, it doesn't it doesn't um, recognize transition or tangential transitions because I happen to know that the bottom half of this is spherical. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to manually paint this red because I know that it's a spherical body. You can see, I just go across, paint all of the component. Now, if I want to have more accuracy, I simply zoom in and you can see the paint region is much, much smaller when I'm zoomed in. As I zoom out, my paint region gets larger and I can accidentally hit the wrong areas of my model. That's okay. I'm just going to paint all of this surface and then I'll come back and fix up the areas that I messed up. All right, that's pretty close. 
I'll switch to magenta and fix up any areas of magenta that I've messed up. That looks good. And then I'll simply switch to cyan. And notice it kind of, it, whoops, it gets the, it, it honours effectively, um, oh, what's it called, the angle between the mesh components. So it is quite easy to generate those very accurately and quickly. Lastly, I go to the extract command, and this is where it will extract surfaces from these regions. Now, if I click on that particular region and say extract, it will go and generate, you can see in there, a spherical surface to match that region. I can also just give it free reign and go say go and extract everything. Now, where I've got some really complex interior surfaces, it basically can't match them up into a single surface and you get some pretty interesting things. This B spline's fine. That B spline is not really what I want. So I simply say delete. That one's fine. That one's fine. I've got my cylindrical, I've got my planar, another planar on top and the spherical. These surfaces are all okay. And you might be thinking, yeah, but they don't really represent my model very well. Well, we can get there. And this is where we switch back to our surfacing tools. And in this case, I'm going to use the intersect command. I'll select all of my surfaces. And I start removing, just with a simple click, the areas. Oops, why isn't that matching? Have I got, oh, I haven't got my spherical surface. Oops, I better go and add that back in. Extract spherical. All right, now I've got my spherical surface. Oop. Sorry, I hit escape there instead of OK. Now I've got my spherical surface. I can actually intersect it with the other surfaces. See, I'm just getting rid of the regions of surface that I don't need. Now you'll notice in here, I've got a little one on top and a little one on the bottom that I don't need. In here, I've got the extension of that cylinder. And in here, I've got the middle of that same on the top of the cylinder. Let me get rid of that and that. And I think I want to get rid of the top of the sphere. Okay. So I say OK and I'll intersect or stitch all of these together. Notice now I've actually got a solid body which I'll toggle into design. However, I don't want to see the mesh anymore. I've got all that I need to do out of the mesh. So I simply come in, delete all of the mesh. That's fine. But what's happened here? Well, it's trying to fit a B-spline surface around a mesh. And you're never going to get a perfectly accurate B-spline on a mesh. We know it's a revolved surface even though you can barely see the gradations on it, it is actually not quite right and you can tell by the wavy line. So how do we fix that up? Well, we can simply use our sketching tools to go from, oops, better select my plane. I'm going to come from here down and I'll intersect tangentially onto the sphere. Now I've got to make that fit. So I'll just bring that down. Adjust my spline so that my curve sits where I need it to do. 
And you might wonder what the use of that is. Well, then I can simply create a revolved surface from that around the center of the cylinder by 360 degrees. And I've got my surface, but I haven't removed the other surface. Well, that's okay. I can simply do a replace face, which will replace this solid surface with this modeled surface. And then all I need to do is come in, create a thin wall, except I don't want to thin wall the bottom part. I want that to be solid. And I have my port glass back in editable real geometry. For example, I might not want that stem to be 11.77. I only want that to be 10. And instead of that being 89.87 um, millimetres, I'll make that a clean 100 millimetres. And of course, I could go in and go nuts with my rendering. Um, just so you see, because we're running short of time, I actually did a port glass rendering on a bench top. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of the reverse engineering package in Solid Edge, which cleans up your STL files, removes the holes, you can isolate your area of interest, you can identify what surface type to fit to the different parts of the mesh, and then you convert that mesh into surfaces and trim and stitch the surfaces back into your solids, or you can leave them as surfaces as desired. So that's all we've got for today. Um, if you've got any questions, and I can see a couple on the pane, we'll, uh, we'll start answering them now. Um, if we don't get to your question or later on, maybe you're watching this on YouTube because we're recording it, um, so you can't obviously answer, ask a question then, please shoot the questions through. You can call us on 1300 883 653 or you can email us on at info at edgeplm.com.au and we will be posting this on YouTube. So we'll switch over and start asking any questions that you may have asked in either the question pane or the chat window. Um, we've got one question here, uh, interesting boat hull example. I would like to see surface curvature analysis on the bottom face uh, to see how the curvature is, has resulted. Um, it looks like Mark has actually left at the moment, so I'll have to answer his question. I'll have to answer him later, but for the rest of you, we certainly do have uh, curvature analysis tools. Um, I don't have the boat hull open at the moment, but we can do curvature shading on this, and we'll find those settings in the model. We can also change, that's a very high level of curvature there, but you can see I can set the high level, the low level, and you can particularly see down the bottom, the curvature changes depending on where in the model you are. From black to no, well black is no curvature, you've got very high level of curvature around here, you've got slightly higher curvature in the top, and that kind of stuff. So we can certainly do curvature analysis. Um, a developed surface, yes Steve, um, it is a developed surface that we were working on with the boat hull. Um, how would we have different colour on the outside to the inside? Uh, it, I'm assuming you're talking about the, um, the glass but you may have been talking about the boat hull. I'll try and answer both of them. With the boat hull, if you want a different colour in key shot on the inside to the outside, then all you do is you use a, the part painter in the part mode to apply a different colour in solid edge. Then when you go to key shot, 
you can override or reapply different colors to both the inside and outside. But you do need to basically give, give Keyshot different colors to start with, and that will allow you to, um, to you know, override different colors in Keyshot. You just have to split the colors in Solid Edge first. Um, someone said they lose uh, changes, materials and colors that were done in Keyshot. That sounds like a support issue. Um, please give us a call if you have any problems. This, like I've demonstrated, is how it's supposed to work. It may be that you haven't saved the Keyshot file or you know, you're starting the Keyshot file from scratch. Uh, we can certainly have a look at that. Um, Barry, do you see any other questions at the moment? Um, I've got I've got one that's talking about the um, uh, key shot and how is it available? Does it come as an add-on module or not? Um, the answer to that is uh, yes, no. Um, it does not come as a, an add-on module uh, to the integrated version of uh, Solid Edge. It comes standard. Uh, on Solid Edge Classic and Solid Edge Premium, um, but it does not come with Solid Edge Foundation or Solid Edge Design and Drafting. However, if you want it um, uh, with with Foundation, you can buy uh, a standalone version of Keyshot, which is relatively expensive compared to the one that comes with Solid Edge uh, Classic. So it'd be much cheaper to upgrade your Foundation to Classic. Than it would be to add on Solid Edge. Uh, sorry, to add on the standalone key shop. But we we um, work with both uh, the integrated one within Solid Edge, and we also sell uh, key shop as standalone package. So your choice is yours. Yep. Um, just got one nice quick one. It's um, sorry. Yep. Uh, just no, got carry on. just got a question on the reverse engineering. Um, when like is it a limited trial limited time beta uh, Siemens have released it and in their in their release statement they've said that the beta will be available for use until the production version is ready and the production version will be included in the classic and the premium environments only I'm not sure that it will even work in the foundation or design and draft modules. Um, you'll have to check that, uh, but it, it, the, it says it's only supported for classic and premium licenses and the academic licenses. Um, is there anything else there, Barry? No? Sounds... Oh, well, it's, sorry. It's, there are a few, but we are running quite late now, so I think probably uh, we'll, um, we'll we'll say good night or good evening. Um, and uh, thank you again, Tom. That was a great demo. Um, and uh, going live is always fraught with danger, but you did very well to get through that. Well done, and well done, Solid Edge, and well done to the uh, the new beta version of the reverse engineering. It's fantastic. So any of you that have got uh, premium or classic. Um, have a go at downloading it and start playing with it because it's only beta, but even still, it seems to be working pretty soundly. So, um, thank you again for attending, everybody, and thank you again, Tom, the demo, and 